Good morning, Fairview family. It's great to see you, and I'm looking forward now to beginning a new study today. Uh, we finished our previous study, Storm Shelter, and now we're going to walk into a new study titled Let Hope In. Uh, this is going to be a great time for us to walk through several stories from the scripture that help us to understand how to find the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to begin in session one by talking about the fact that hope is needed. Every single person needs to realize that they need to experience the hope that God can give. Uh, we live in a world today where hope often is belittled to the point of just wishful thinking. For instance, someone says, well, I sure hope that things go well for me tomorrow, or I sure hope that I have enough money to make it through this week. You know, that's just wishful thinking, really. But the kind of hope we're talking about and that we're going to look at in this study over these next six weeks is a hope that relates to the assurance that we get from knowing Jesus, from having a relationship with him. We now have a hope that is set in the heavens. We have the assurance that God has prepared for us a place in heaven with him because of the relationship that we have with him through his son, Jesus. And we're going to talk more and more about that in the coming weeks. But today, let's again, let's start with this idea of realizing that everyone needs to find hope. All right, let's do just like we did in our last study. Let's begin each day with uh, a question. So here's our question today. All right. What did you want to be when you grew up? You know, when you were a kid and people obviously probably asked you that question. I got asked that question a lot. They'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Now, every time I think I was asked that question, I probably said something different. <laughs> Seems like I probably changed all the time. And uh, so this was something that uh, I guess was fluid in my life. You know, I mean, one week I wanted to be an Air Force pilot. And I know why, because my dad was in the Air Force and uh, he'd take us out to Barksdale sometimes. We'd look at the planes. So for me, I thought, man, that would be awesome to get to be an Air Force pilot. So for a while, I wanted to do that. And then uh, then I wanted to be a veterinarian for a while because I liked animals. My dad was a biologist. I mean, listen to this. And, you know, the people who raised you influence you, right? So uh, my dad was a game biologist. And so I thought, well, animals would be cool. So then I thought, well, I'll be a biologist or I'll be a vet or something like that. And even one point, I even wanted to work in a zoo. And that's because we made a trip one time to the St. Louis Zoo. And so I thought, oh, that was so neat. And uh, if I could just work in a zoo. So, you know, all these, these thoughts of what I might want to do in the future kept changing all the time. Uh, and I really didn't know where I needed to be. But here's one, what was so wonderful. The older I got, the more God began to guide me. And as I listened to the Lord, he set in my heart the real hope that I have in him. That if I'll trust him and I'll look to him, he will guide me day to day, and he'll show me what he wants me to do with my life. So I, it came to that point where God began to show me the plan that he had for my life, and that was ultimately to be a pastor. So uh, God does that for us. He guides us step by step along the way as we trust in him. Uh, for children, oftentimes, this is, this is a difficult process. Children have their whole life in front of them, and oftentimes we'll tell them things like that. We'll say, you know, set your sights high or... We'll tell them to uh, uh, dream big, you know. We, we, we kind of put these things in front of them. We tell them the sky's the limit, you know. We have these little sayings sometimes we give them uh, to encourage hope in their lives and hope in their hearts. And so what we're wanting them to do is find that anchor for the soul. And, and what we're going to learn in these coming weeks is that God is the anchor of our soul, and he's the one in whom we must find our hope for all of eternity. So as life moves forward... Uh, we are trying harder and harder to find the plan that God has for us to seek out his will. Hopefully we're doing that. And as we do that, uh, what we realize is we fail at points. You know, God doesn't fail us, but, but we fail him. And so then this is where it really gets difficult because here we are living in a fallen world and we're trying to do our best. We're trying to be hopeful about the future, but we keep finding that we're struggling because we have a sin problem. So it, it holds us back. In, in those moments, we begin to feel overwhelmed. We begin to feel broken. And at points, even drifting, a drift in life. And so it's in those moments when we begin to ask this question, is it too late for me? Is there any hope for my future? You know, is there anything I can 
do that's going to correct my course in life. We begin to ask some hard questions of ourselves, and if we're not careful and look to the right source for hope, we'll be adrift and we will begin to get depressed. And that's not what God wants us to, to do in life. That's not where he wants us to be. So the truth that the Bible teaches us and that we learn from Scripture is that hope is always possible and it is a present reality when we put our faith and trust in God through his son, Jesus Christ. And so we want to look at that. I hope you have your Bible. Uh, take a Bible if you don't have a paper copy. Maybe get it there on your phone or your tablet or whatever you're looking at. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. Today we'll start here, 2 Samuel 9, and it's a really good place to begin to uh, pick up this theme. The theme of today's lesson is this, you are never beyond hope. And we're going to look at the story of a man who thought he, his life was over. He thought he had run to the end of his course and, and he was going to die shortly and with nothing. But what we're going to learn in the story is that if we'll trust God and look to God, we're never beyond hope. He'll always take care of us. So we're going to find hope then in a peculiar place. Uh, when a man thinks he's at the end of his rope, uh, he finds that there's hope. All right. And I didn't try to make that rhyme. It just did. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there's a young man who needed hope and he found hope in the mercy that was shown to him unexpectedly. So uh, let's read about this. This young man's name was Mephibosheth. Now, that'd be a good name to hold back. You know, if you've got uh, children in the future or grandchildren coming in the future, uh, grandparents and encourage your kids to name your grandchild Mephibosheth. That'd be a great name, you know. Uh, try to get your teachers in school to spell that one. That'd be even better. But anyway, here's old Mephibosheth, the grandson of King Saul. Just remember that. He's the grandson of King Saul. Let's look. 2 Samuel uh, chapter 2. Let's pick up in... I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 9, y'all. We're going to pick up in verse 6. The Bible says, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David. He bowed down to the ground and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth, I am your servant, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, since I intend to show you kindness because of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all your grandfather's Saul's fields, and you will always eat meals at my table. Now, this is an interesting scene. So let's backtrack a few minutes and understand what brought us to this moment. Um, we know Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan, who is the son of Saul. So Saul was his granddad. And we know that Saul and David were competitors in a way. Saul saw in David competition to his throne, and he didn't like that. And so numerous times throughout First and Second Samuel, we see that uh, Saul was trying to kill David. Uh, David and Jonathan had built a very close friendship. They were best of friends. And so David, uh, at some point in his reign as king, wants to show kindness to anyone who might be left of Jonathan's family. Uh, see, not, not too much before this event, uh, King Saul and Jonathan and the rest of his sons were killed in battle. There had been a great battle with the Philistines. And you remember David had shown out for the Lord a little bit. God showed himself strong through David when they killed Goliath. Well, Saul and Jonathan tried to finish the deal. They tried to finish off the rest of the Philistines, but they were killed in battle. When this happens, Mephibosheth uh, and his family are exiled because now uh, their family is no longer in uh, power in, in Israel. Now, if you go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 4, what you find is in verse 4, the, the story of how Mephibosheth uh, came to be living in exile. He had a nanny. At the time, he was five years old. He was a young boy. And he had a nanny who had him in her arms. When word came that Jonathan, Saul, and all the other uh, siblings were murdered then or killed in battle, then she fled with the young boy Mephibosheth in her arms and she stumbled and fell or dropped the boy, however it worked out, and his legs were injured. We don't know if they were broken or dislocated or whatever, but of course, without the uh, medical science and technology that we have today, they weren't able to restore his limbs. And so he grew up with basically probably deformed legs at this point. They didn't heal right. And so he was lame. He couldn't walk. He wasn't pro properly able to properly walk. And, uh, so this is a 
number one, a disability he's struggling with, but not only that physical disability, but he's also dealing with uh, the shame and the guilt that comes with knowing that my grandfather tried to kill on numerous occasions the man who is now in power. David has come to the throne. He's now the king of Israel. And so you can see now where Mephibosheth is in a difficult place in life. And he just doesn't feel as if he's, he's got much hope. You know, if ever there was a person who understood what it was like to be an outsider looking in, it was Mephibosheth. It was this man. Uh, his grandfather Saul, again, was the main persecutor of the man who's now the king in power. So when this king, when David uh, says to his servant Ziba, I want to find somebody to show kindness to from Jonathan's family. And word comes that Mephibosheth is still around. He's living in exile. David sends for him. Now, what's interesting is Mephibosheth was living in exile at a place called Lodabar. And in Hebrew, that word means no pasture. Uh, another way to translate that would be not just no pastures, but like no provisions or no, even no communication. So, there's a couple of different ways that word could have been used, but but literally no pasture is what it meant. He was just living out in the middle of nowhere, if you just want to put it, put it in those terms. And uh, so he was living nowhere with no hope. And uh, when word gets to him that David's looking for him, you can imagine the first thing that went through his mind was, oh no, why is David looking for me? What does he want from me? What's gonna happen to me? And so you can see where there's little hope of a future. As a matter of fact, the only hope probably that Mephibosheth had was the fact that uh, his death might come quickly. <laughs> that would make, maybe it'd be a painless death. Uh, that's, not, that's not much hope at all to have in life. So here's a man, as we've said before, struggling in so many ways, physically, emotionally, socially. He's on the outside in every way. He's, have, he's got a very difficult life with little to no hope. I think in many ways we can all probably understand a little bit about where this man was. We can probably relate in more ways than we realize with this man. You might say, well, I don't have a physical disability like that, and and, and I have family. I'm not out, out living in the middle of nowhere on my own. You know, I have people around me. and So in some ways you think, well, I don't have anything in common with him. But I really want you to think for a minute. I think in, in our own ways we all at times in life, or even now, have had struggles that put us in a place where we can relate. Uh, first of all, I think we've all experienced suffering uh, that was not our fault. It was really no one's fault, but it came because of the circumstances of life. We've all had those things happen. You know, something happened and we live in a fallen world and we live in a world that's tainted with sin. And so we all at points suffer not because someone else did anything wrong or I did anything wrong, just because of the circumstances in which we find ourselves sometimes in life. We, we go through tragedies, we go through sicknesses, we go through hardships that come, and um, they weren't necessarily caused by anyone, but it's because we live in a fallen world. So we can identify with the circumstances that Mephibosheth found himself in in that way. Uh, another thing is we, we've all experienced suffering directly, because of someone else's sin. We've all been there. Someone else did something wrong and I'm the one that paid the penalty or the price for it. And that happened with Mephibosheth. He didn't do anything uh, to David directly. It was his grandfather who tried to, to do in David. So Mephibosheth felt well, that somehow though he was to blame now because he's the only living descendant. So, uh, But we've all encountered moments when we, uh, because of someone else's sin, felt like we were in the line of fire. But there's also another way we can identify probably, and that's that we've all experienced suffering due to our own poor choices. You see, here's the reality. Mephibosheth chose to go live at Lodabar. Nobody sent him out there. He chose to stay there too. I don't think anybody, as far as the scripture tells us, no one was forcing him to be there. Uh, I think he probably felt like he needed to be out there. He needed to be away from David. He was afraid to come to David. But what's interesting is, and that's what we just read, David wanted him to come to him. He wanted Mephibosheth to feel welcome. He wanted Mephibosheth to feel like he had a place uh, to live. So uh, this, is, this is an important part of the story to realize that we, like Mephibosheth, have been in these moments when we felt these ways and we experienced this kind of hopelessness. Let's pick up in verse eight. Look, look again, 2 Samuel 9, verse eight. It says, Mephibosheth, when bowed down and said, 
What is your servant that you take an interest in a dead dog like me? Man, listen to that. David does something here that, of course, to Mephibosheth is totally unexpected when he reaches out to him. He did not expect him to reach out to him that way, but Mephibosheth was reluctant to respond because he did not realize or maybe even understand the nature that of David, you know, the way he was, the kind of heart he had, uh, and he surely didn't understand his his inquiry. Why was David looking for him? You know, he didn't he didn't understand. That. He wasn't sure. Uh, again, he might have thought David was simply maneuvering, uh, buttering him up, reeling him in so he could kill him. You know, he, he didn't know. He wasn't sure of David's motives at this point. And so when Mephibosheth approached David, look how he came. He bowed down to the ground. He put himself on the lowest position. And he calls himself a dead dog. I think, the again, as I said before, the only hope he had of surviving this encounter with the new king was to put himself in the lowest position. And perhaps he thought he was really unworthy of any hope of life after this. I, maybe he felt like this was it. This was the, the last moment of his life. And so he called himself a dead dog. But what's interesting is David's not wanting to harm him. David is offering to him grace. Now, in some ways, this interchange between these two men is precisely what happens between us and the king of eternity, between us and God when we first meet him. You see, God is gracious, kind of like David was being gracious in this moment. God is a gracious king, and he wants to extend mercy to us, to every person. But we come to him emotionally broken. We come spiritually bankrupt and even at points physically battered by the world that we live in. And so it's difficult for us, like it was difficult for Mephibosheth. It, sometimes it's difficult for people to accept grace and respond to God's grace. We're waiting at any moment for the hammer of God to fall on our life and, and, and do, us, do us dead. <laughs> <laughs> to be a dead dog. Let's just say it that way, like Mephibosheth said it. We're ready for it all to end. We think God's going to bring his hammer of judgment on us at any moment. But what's incredible is we get surprised by grace. Uh, I hope you've been there. I hope you've experienced God's grace in the way that Mephibosheth did, where you're surprised by it. It shocks you that God loves you and cares for you this way. So when Mephibosheth called himself a dead dog, it really speaks volumes then about how he saw himself uh, how his identity had been shaped and even solidified by the tragedy that he'd been through in life, by the pain that he'd gone through. You see, he had endured years of being ostracized or years of disability, years of wondering if God had cursed him or hated him. Uh, there's probably all kinds of things like that that went through his mind at some point. But there are, I think, two things primarily that kept him hopeless. And, and you can pick up on this already in what we're reading. Uh, shame and regret. Uh, shame because of the way his grandfather Saul had tried to treat David and regret over the fact that uh, he had then had to live the way he'd had to live all these years. Or in his mind, he felt like he had to be separated. He felt like he had to be in exile. And so uh, these thoughts probably were swimming in his mind. And these two things probably kept him far from, from the Lord and from David. Uh, you know, and that's true in our lives. Guilt when we had experienced guilt because of our sin, our past sin, guilt says, I did something wrong. While shame comes behind guilt and says, I'm wrong and I'm worthless. Now listen to that. Two kind of different thoughts that are connected. Guilt can say, you're wrong. You did something wrong. And so you're going to pay a price for it. But shame will linger often behind that and say, I am wrong. There's something wrong with me and I'm worthless. And we don't want to live that way. We don't want to be caught in that because shame doesn't just declare a need for redemption. It deceptively denies me passage to a place of restoration. Listen to that again. Shame doesn't just declare that I need to be redeemed. But what that's what guilt tells me. What shame does is it goes further. It, it deceptively fools me into believing that I'm not worthy to be restored. And so shame can make me feel as if I deserve to be shackled forever, that I need to be in, somehow in the chains of my sin forever. But God's grace is what sets us free from guilt and shame. God's mercy and his grace, the fact that Christ paid the penalty for us at the cross, that sets us free from past shame, 
uh, guilt and shame. And so uh, we need to, to realize that. Now, remember, there was one other thing that was really probably uh, difficult for Mephibosheth, and that was regret. Probably regret over all the past uh, years that he'd missed and lost and, and the things that had happened uh, through his grandfather and his other family. And regret is often what I feel when I've done something or someone close to me has done something uh, that I wish I hadn't done or I hadn't, that wish they hadn't done. Uh, but when regret is not dealt with directly, when it is not dealt with redemptively, it leads to more regret. And, and then again, shame creeps back in. So th these are things that hope helps to deal with. Hope, when we have true hope, assurance. Remember, hope is assurance. It's knowing certainly or surely that God loves us and, and has mercy toward us. That when we know that and we have that, it's a game changer. It changes the way we approach God and the way we approach our life. So shame and regret have the ability to keep me from seeing there's hope right in front of me. God wants to offer me grace and mercy, and it's right in front of me. Uh, and Mephibosheth struggled with this. He struggled with it as he saw David coming to him. All right, let's pick back up in our story. Let's start again in verse 9 and go down through verse 13. Let's finish this up. Verse 9 says, then the king summoned Saul's attendant Ziba and said to him, I've given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and his family. You, your sons, and your servants are to work the ground for him, and you are to bring in the crops so your master's grandson will have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do all my all." My lord, the king commands. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table just like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. Also, all those living in Ziba's house were Mephibosheth's servants. However, Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Again, we're just reminded at the end, no matter the disability he had, he still had a place in God's family. He still had a place in David's family. And again, that's a picture of us. No matter our perceived disability, whether it's physical and mental, emotional, or whatever, we remember that God's grace and, and mercy is sufficient. And we always have a place at his table. If we'll come to him and turn to him, he gives us that place. The only hope that Mephibosheth had was when he learned to trust in the mercy and grace of the king. And uh, David had those really encouraging words for him. Did you see what it said back in verse nine? He said, or, or there it said, he said, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. I think it was back in verse seven. He said, do not be afraid. And, that, and those are probably the most important words that Mephibosheth heard. Do not be afraid. Come to the Lord, come to God, trust his grace, trust his mercy, and let him handle uh, the past. So I want you to think for a minute, how have you responded to God? When God has said to you, do not be afraid, how have you responded? I think there are several ways we might respond. One, we respond sometimes with insecurity, and, and that's where we say, do I really deserve this? Sometimes we respond with skepticism, which is saying, what's the catch, God? You know, what's this all about? You know, why are you doing this? Why are you offering me this uh, sometimes we not respond with excitement, you know, when God does something. We're just like, man, this is awesome. This is great. This is incredible. God, why would you do something this wonderful for me? Other times, maybe we respond with guilt. Uh, we think, uh, man, I don't deserve this. I shouldn't accept this. I, I, I can't accept this because I, I don't deserve this. You know, we have this false guilt that creeps over us. But, but even though we go through those moments, and uh, like Mephibosheth, he he, he, he probably wondered what he should do. I'm thankful that Mephibosheth was wise enough to choose to accept the offer of grace and live in the hope that he was given by David. And that's really what it comes down for us. We have to finally just be wise enough to say, God, I can't fix my past. I can't go back and, and undo the things that have been done. I can't rewrite history in that way. But God, you can offer me the hope of a future. And so we have to come to that place where we're wise enough, like Mephibosheth, to just accept it. Accept God's grace, receive his mercy, and uh, receive forgiveness, and find a new place at his table. 
And we, we have to get to that place where we learn to forgive ourselves as we accept God's forgiveness and his grace into our life. So uh, the fulfillment of hope that came in Mephibosheth's life really, I guess you could say, happened in three ways. Um, first of all, the choices of others no longer were held against him. He had to get to that place where he understood that. Uh, Saul's choices in the past, they were Saul's choices. They weren't Mephibosheth's. And he didn't have to bear the penalty for his grandfather's sins and choices, all right? He needed to just move forward and just be responsible for himself and what he could control. Uh, secondly, though I think he was free from his own poor choices of seclusion and regret. You know, he, he had chosen to live at Lodabar. He had chosen to be in exile. Uh, no one commanded that. That was something he was doing and, and just living out there in that condition. Uh, sometimes we can wallow in our in our past and we can uh, uh, really make our life worse because we're not willing to move forward. We're not ready to accept grace and mercy and move into the future. And so we have to remind ourselves uh, not to seclude ourselves from the Lord, and, and but to come to him and uh, accept the grace and mercy he wants to give so freely. Uh, one last thing, though, was that what really brought about the fulfillment of hope for Mephibosheth, I think, was the fact that the king restored him. Now, listen to that. The king restored him. Mephibosheth didn't fix himself. The king restored him. Listen, you can't fix you, and you can't deal with your past on your own. The king has to restore you. God has to restore you. He's the king of eternity. He's the one that's got to set you free and give you hope for the future. Listen, we all need hope. Uh, like Mephibosheth, we all need to accept God's grace and learn to live in the light of the fact that we are never beyond hope. I hope this has blessed you today, and I hope you look forward to joining me again next week for another episode in this series called Let Hope In.